Moore and Marsha Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the UVA School of Medicine. And I'm delighted to see all of you here this afternoon. This is a quote from a new book. My job title is medical actor, which means I play sick. I get paid by the hour. Medical students guess my maladies. I'm called a standardized patient which means I act toward the norms set for my disorder. I'm standardized lingo SP for short. So begins the Empathy Exams, the title essay in writer Leslie Jameson's much praised new book. In this medical center hour, titled Empathy and Inquiry, we'll be looking at empathy. While the world of medicine and healthcare may sometimes claim empathy as something exclusively its own, a phenomenon at the heart of the patient-physician encounter. This ability to understand and share the condition and feelings of another from that other's perspective is actually a feature of interpersonal connection across the spectrum of human experience. And empathy may be something more fraught than we often imagine it to be. It isn't just an instinctive reaction, but a more complicated blend of intuition and decision. And it's not necessarily an unequivocal good. Empathy itself bears examining, and not just by doctors. And so we've invited Leslie Jameson to talk with us about empathy today. In this medical center hour, she'll draw both on her experiences as an SP at a medical school and on her work as a journalist to consider what makes for good empathy and what good empathy can do. Leslie Jamison is a well-rounded <coughs> scholar and purveyor of words, an alumna of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, author of a critically acclaimed novel, a journalist, a teacher of writing, and also a doctoral student in literature at Yale University. She writes and pub publishes widely, and so young. <laughs> the Empathy Exams, which appeared earlier this year, won Gray Wolf Press's nonfiction award. Uh, the UVA bookstore is here with the book for sale, and Ms. Jameson has kindly agreed to sign copies after the program. So join me now, please, in welcoming Leslie Jameson, and we're going to have empathy and be great. Thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you, Marsha, for inviting me. And I, one of the things, and I'll talk more about this later, but one of the things I've really enjoyed about the process of this book coming out is how many ways in which it's permitted me to have conversations with people from very different disciplines. I've spent a lot, I spent most of my professional life in the world of writing, which is a rich and diverse world, but I've loved the chance to talk to doctors, other kinds of healthcare providers, and, and feel their responses to some of the stuff that I bring up and some of the issues and dilemmas that I address in the book. So I'm looking forward very much to the questions portion of this as well and to hearing some of your thoughts and reactions to, to what I put out there. I thought I would start by speaking a bit about why I chose to call this talk what I did, an inquiry, and why where the title of my collection and the exams came from. Um, the, when I worked as a medical actor, one of the items on my checklist when I evaluated medical students after they would do their kind of mock diagnoses with me uh, was, you know, I was literally evaluating the, the kind of empathy they had shown me during our 15 minute interaction. And I started to think about, that was the first time I really thought about empathy explicitly. Of course I thought about it all the time in the way that we all think about it all the time. Every time we're having an interaction with another person and trying to think about where they're coming from or how they might be experiencing the situation that we're in. But I had never graded it before. I had never had it be an official item on a checklist. And so in a sense, those experiences that I was having with medical students were empathy exams of a kind, but really when I think about it in application to the collection as a whole, it's, it's as much as anything it's empathy exams that I subjected myself to. So each piece looks at some sort of extreme or difficult experience, either something I've gone through in some of the more memoiristic essays in the collection or 
experiences that other people have gone through and tries to think about what is important and what's difficult about imagining what this experience is like for another person. So there's an essay in the collection about Morgellons disease, which I imagine many of you have some familiarity with, but a controversial skin disorder in which people who report as having Morgellons disease will report a variety of skin symptoms, the most remarkable of which is the emergence of strange kind of unexplainable fibers from underneath their skin. And I, I wasn't interested in adjudicating whether or not this was real. I'm not qualified to do that. But I, what I did do was go to an annual conference that Morgellons patients have. They convene each year in Austin. And I went to that conference to figure out what kind of community was being formed around this shared sense of illness and what kind of support they were giving to each other and what the ways in which they had felt kind of marginalized and ignored by the world. And in, that, in the process of reporting that piece, I felt my own empathy tested in certain important ways because I didn't always agree with the narratives that those Morgellons patients were offering me about their lives. But I did feel very strongly that they were in pain, that, there was a, a, that they were suffering, that they were experiencing difficulty. But the way in which they would explain the causes of that difficulty wouldn't necessarily have been the narrative that I would have used. And so I started thinking about, you know, to what extent can you empathize with somebody's experience without completely identifying with their explanation of that experience? That kind of put pressure on empathy from one direction. Other pieces in the collection are much more explicitly concerned with the boundary between empathy and voyeurism. So I, I take a tour of a silver mine in Bolivia, which is outside of a town called Potosi. And that's become a kind of tourist industry there. People pay, you pay to go on a tour, and you see these miners in what are essentially really kind of unimaginably horrendous conditions, the underground for 12-hour shifts, sometimes back to back. And, and I, you know, Taking that tour, I asked myself, like, what is the good of this kind of knowledge or this kind of proximity or this kind of exposure? Is this facilitating empathy or is it something much more sensationalist than that? Um, I also thought about that question. I took a um, what's called a gang tour. I'm from Los Angeles and I, I returned home to take one of these tours, which is essentially a bus tour of gang territories in LA. So you, you're touring around and you're hearing bits of history. Here we are at Florence and Normandy. This is what happened at the corner of Florence and Normandy in the early 90s. And um, I, you know, I thought again about that. What does it mean to take an air-conditioned bus ride through places where this kind of violence has happened? There is a kind of knowledge that's being imparted, but there's also a kind of souvenir quality to the experience that's being imparted. So I was thinking through, in many of the pieces in this question, I was thinking through the way in which empathy can also become a kind of packaged commodity. And we can start to feel so good about our own capacity to experience empathy that it kind of short circuits other important parts of the process, like what kind of actions can the emotional experience of empathy catalyze, and how do we kind of avoid or give ourselves an alibi out of some of those modes of action if we feel too good about the, the feelings themselves. Um, so that, you know, and, and that wonderful introduction, Marsha, which I do feel like got to the heart of a lot of core dilemmas for the book, I, I you know, I set out, I never, first of all, I never set out to write a book about empathy. It just, um, I ended up realizing at a certain point that all the questions I was interested in asking had something to do with empathy, but I certainly was never setting out as a kind of cheerleader for empathy or somebody who, wanted to uh, pr proselytize a particular program of feeling or being to anyone. But I was surprised by the number and variety of ways in which I started to find a kind of trouble or peril in, in certain kinds of empathy. And one of those perils was certainly the way that feeling could come to seem like a destination or an end in, in itself. Um, and so I, I want to sort of posit the ways in which I think what I do writing, I mean, I write explicitly about empathy, and, and this book has become a kind of, uh, it's, it's very much traveled through the world under the umbrella of empathy as a thematic concern. But really, to me, and I think to so many people, all of writing is about empathy in some way. And I, one thing I wanted to set out at the beginning of the talk was my, my work as a writer, I've worked in, in fiction and nonfiction, and I think that both of those modes of writing 
require a certain kind of empathy, but very different kinds of empathy. And I want to kind of put them up as two poles in terms of thinking about what empathy consists of. So my, my work as a novelist and a fiction writer is very much involved in imagining other lives and imagining lives that have never been and thinking about the interior, the interior contours of those lives and what it's like to be these characters and fleshing out their emotions and their psychology and their motivations and their desires and their fears. And, and so all of that is a, a kind of active, massive projection. And you hope at a certain point, and a lot of writers will talk about this point where your characters start talking back to you or sort of feel like they have enough integrity as, as invented figures that you start listening to them. And I think that I've experienced that feeling, but at the end of the day, it's still you imagining another self. Whereas my work as a journalist is involved in something quite different, where I'm literally listening, if I'm doing my job right, I'm listening to my subjects and allowing their stories and their words to, in some important ways, shape the terms of the story I tell about them. And, um, and certainly the, you know, the ethics of being a responsible journalist, like interviewing and making sure that the quotes you offer in your piece correspond with what was actually said, all of those are ways of holding empathy accountable to the, the voice of the actual other subject who's speaking. So, that you know, as a journalist, you might start to have your own version of somebody's story, or the way you want to spin it, or the way you want to frame it. But that act of always listening in the initial conversation, and then in every subsequent drafting, really holding yourself accountable to the other person's words, that for me points at a really important facet of what empathy should be, which is to say empathy isn't just imagining what it's like to be somebody else. It's really trying to absorb their words on what what it's like to be them. And I think that one of the ways that empathy can go wrong is when that balance between imagining and listening gets off, where you know there's, there's so much force of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes that you're not really, you're, you're not listening to the, the pushback from them about where your imagining of what it's like to be in their shoes has gone astray or doesn't accord with how they feel. So I think in that way, the work of a journalist when we're thinking about what empathy is, puts a useful kind of pressure on the work of the novelist or the fiction writer in terms of balancing, um, absorbing, and, and imagining. Um, so what I thought I would do is read a bit from the opening essay of my collection, which is about my work as a medical actor and thinking about my work as a medical actor alongside uh, certain experiences I've had as a, a medical patient. Um, in a, in a way, working as a medical actor gave me a kind of framework or apparatus for thinking about experiences I had with doctors when I was like on the table, um, where I think, at least for me, I found that even though I you know, spent a lot of time in intellectual environments and, and, and you know, in certain ways have found a way of inhabiting my own voice, I found that the experience of being a patient even if you're working with a wonderful doctor, and certainly if you're working with somebody who's, who's less sensitive, can be extremely disempowering. It can be very hard to feel like you have a strong voice when you're also very prominently like a body in the room and in some way a body with which something is going wrong or has gone wrong. And, and so I think that for me, I've gone through lots of experiences of, as a patient where I hadn't felt like I would had a lot of agency or known how to have a voice. And working as a standardized patient kind of gave me a way to, to rediscover a voice inside of some of those experiences. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but I just want to you know, set, set the stage, and I know that the, the environment and situations that come uh, attached to medical acting are familiar to many of you from the other side, um, but, but I thought I'd read a few words about what it was like to be one of the actors doing the pretending. And I would start with the first paragraph, but y'all already heard it, so I'll start with the second one. Um, medical acting works like this. You get a script and a paper gown. You get $13.50 an hour. Our scripts are 10 to 12 pages long. They outline what's wrong with us, not just what hurts, but how to express it. They tell us how much to give away and when. 
We are supposed to unfurl the answers according to specific protocol. The scripts dig deep into our fictive lives, the ages of our children and the diseases of our parents, the names of our husband's real estate and graphic design firms, the amount of weight we've lost in the past year, the amount of alcohol we drink each week. My specialty case is Stephanie Phillips, a 23-year-old who suffers from something called conversion disorder. She is grieving the death of her brother, and her grief has sublimated into seizures. Her disorder is news to me. I didn't know you could convulse from sadness. She's not supposed to know either. She's not supposed to think the seizures have anything to do with what she's lost. Our simulated exams take place in three suites of purpose-built rooms. Each room is fitted with an examination table and a surveillance camera. We test second and third year medical students in topical rotations, pediatrics, surgery, psychiatry. On any given exam day, each student must go through encounters, their technical title, with three or four actors playing different cases. A student might have to palpate a woman's 10 on scale of 10 sorry, abdominal pain, then sit across from a delusional young lawyer and tell him that when he feels a writhing mass of worms in his small intestine, the feeling is probably coming from somewhere else. Then this med student might arrive in my room, stay straight-faced, and tell me that I'm about to go into premature labor to deliver the pillow strapped to my belly, or nod solemnly as I express concern about my ailing plastic baby. He's just so quiet. <laughs> Once the 15-minute encounter has ended, the medical student leaves the room, and I fill out an evaluation of his slash her performance. The first part is a checklist. Which crucial pieces of information did he slash she manage to elicit? Which ones did he slash she leave uncovered? The second part of the evaluation covers affects. Checklist item 31 is generally acknowledged as the most important category. Quote, voice empathy for my situation slash problem. We are instructed about the importance of this first word, voiced. It's not enough for someone to have a sympathetic manner or use a caring tone. The students have to say the right words to get credit for compassion. We SPs are given our own suite for preparation and decompression. We gather in clusters, old men in crinkling blue robes, MFAs in boots too cool for our paper gowns, local teenagers in hospital ponchos and sweatpants. We help each other strap pillows around our waists. We hand off infant dolls. Little mnemonic baby Doug, swaddled in a cheap cotton blanket, is passed from girl to girl like a relay baton. Our ranks are full of community theater actors and undergrad drama majors seeking stages, high school kids earning booze money, retired folks with spare time, I am a writer, which means I'm trying not to be broke. We play a demographic menagerie. Young jocks with ACL injuries and business executives nursing coke habits. STD grandma has just cheated on her husband of 40 years and has a case of gonorrhea to show for it. She hides behind her shame like a veil, and her med student is supposed to part the curtain. If he asks the right questions, she'll have a simulated crying breakdown halfway through the encounter. Blackout Buddy gets makeup, a gash on his chin, a black eye, and bruises smudged in green eyeshadow along his cheekbone. He's been an offender bender he can't even remember. Before the encounter, the actor splashes booze on his body like cologne. He's supposed to let the particulars of his alcoholism glimmer through, very unplanned bits of a secret he's done his best to keep guarded. Our scripts are studded with moments of flourish. Pregnant Lila's husband is a yacht captain sailing overseas off Croatia. Appendicitis Angela has a dead guitarist uncle whose tour bus was hit by a tornado. 
Many of our infected family members have died violent Midwestern deaths. I was working at the University of Iowa at the time. <laughs> they have been mauled in tractor or grain elevator accidents, hit by drunk drivers on the way home from Hy-Vee grocery stores, felled by big weather or big ten tailgates, firearm accident, or, like my brother Will, by the quieter aftermath of debauchery. Between encounters, we are given water, fruit, granola bars, and an endless supply of mints. We aren't supposed to exhaust the students with our bad breath and our growling stomachs, the side effects of our actual bodies. Some med students get nervous during our encounters. It's like an awkward date, except half of them are wearing platinum wedding bands. I want to tell them I'm more than just an unmarried woman faking seizures for pocket money. I do things, I want to tell them. I'm probably going to write about this in a book someday. <laughs> we make small talk about the rural Iowa farm town I'm supposed to be from. We understand that we each understand the other is inventing this small talk, and we agree to respond to each other's inventions as genuine exposures of personality. We're holding the fiction between us like a jump rope. One time, a student forgets. I was telling the story to Sam last night. One time, a student forgets we are pretending and starts asking detailed questions about my fake hometown, which, as it happens, is his real hometown. And the questions lie beyond the purview of my script, beyond what I can answer, because in truth, I don't know much about the person I'm supposed to be or the place I'm supposed to be from. He has forgotten our contract. I bullshit harder, more hardly. <laughs> that park in Muscatine, I say, slapping my knee like a grandpa. I used to sled there as a kid. <laughs> Other students are all business. They rattle through the clinical checklist for depression like a list of things they need to get at the grocery store. Sleep disturbances, changes in appetite, decreased concentration. Some of them get irritated when I obey my script and refuse to make eye contact. I'm supposed to stay swaddled and numb. These irritated students take my averted eyes as a challenge. They never stop seeking my gaze, wrestling me into eye contact with the way they maintain power, forcing me to acknowledge their requisite display of care. I grow accustomed to comments that feel aggressive in their formulaic insistence. That must really be hard to have a dying baby. That must really be hard to be afraid you'll have another seizure in the middle of the grocery store. That must really be hard to carry in your uterus the bacterial evidence of cheating on your husband. Why not say, I couldn't even imagine. Other students seem to understand that empathy is always perched precariously between gifts and invasion. They won't even press the stethoscope to my skin without asking if it's okay. They need permission. They don't want to presume. Their stuttering unwittingly honors my privacy. Can I, could I, would you mind if I listened to your heart? No, I tell them, I don't mind. Not minding is my job. Their humility is a kind of compassion in its own right. Humility means they ask questions, and questions mean they get answers, and answers mean they get points on the checklist. A point for finding out my mother takes Wellbutrin. A point for getting me to admit I've spent the last two years cutting myself. A point for finding out my father died in a grain elevator when I was two. For realizing that a root system of loss stretches radial and rhizomatic under the entire territory of my life. In a sense, empathy isn't just measured by checklist item 31, voice empathy for my situation <coughs> problem, but by every item that gauges how thoroughly my experience has been imagined. Empathy isn't just remembering to say, that must really be hard, it's figuring out how to bring difficulty into the light so it can be seen at all. Empathy isn't just listening, it's asking the questions whose answers need to be listened to. Empathy requires inquiry as much as imagination. Empathy requires knowing you know nothing. Empathy means acknowledging a horizon of context that extends perpetually beyond what you can see. An old woman's gonorrhea is connected to her guilt, is connected to her marriage, is connected to her children, is connected to the days when she was a child. All this is connected to her domestically stifled mother in turn and to her parents' unbroken marriage. Maybe everything traces its roots to her very first period, how it shamed and thrilled her. <laughs> 
Empathy means realizing no trauma has discrete edges. Trauma bleeds out of wounds and across boundaries. Sadness becomes a seizure. Empathy demands another kind of porousness in response. My Stephanie script is 12 pages long. I think mainly about what it doesn't say. Empathy comes from the Greek empathia, M into and pathos, feeling, a penetration, a kind of travel. It suggests you enter another person's pain as you'd enter another country through immigration and customs, border crossing by way of query. What grows where you are? What are the laws? What animals graze there? Um, and the piece moves from there to some of my own experiences as, as a patient and, um, and, and also talks a bit about, you know, one of the things that came up for me as I was working as a medical actor wasn't just a deepened awareness of what I wanted or needed or the kinds of empathy that being a patient uh, ideally demands, but also I, I, I'd like to think that in some small, very partial way, I gained some empathy for what it means to be a doctor trying to compress a number of different tasks into uh, what I realize is often a very short period of time where you're trying to gather information, trying to offer information, and also amidst all of that, trying to establish some kind of affect dynamic, affective dynamic that is productive and caring. Um, and just seeing the students and everything that they were juggling in those 15 minute sort of uh, staged encounters, I, I became aware of how much was, was on the table for, for both people inside any one of those interactions in real life. Um, so I guess I wanted to talk a bit about the ways in which I have come to think about empathy as a series of tensions. And one of those comes from that passage in the book where I talk about empathy is perched somewhere between gift and invasion, where I do think empathy is something we offer one another, but I also think there can be something quite tyrannical about offering too insistently, like, I, I know what it's like to be you, or to assume in some way I know what it's like to be you. And I want very much in my writing and my being as a person to always honor the gap and the limits in, in what can be imagined. Um, and I guess I would say, over the course of writing these essays, and especially the title essay, my thinking about empathy evolved in a number of ways, but there are two major ways that I think are useful to talk about. And one of those is certainly, and it was a bit earlier, but that I, that I started to see all the ways in which empathy is flawed and complicated, and in which it's really limiting the conversation to just posit empathy as good and somehow treat that as self-evident or self-explanatory. And the second way my thinking about empathy evolved has to do with formula and program and intention. And you know, as I, as I write about in the passage that I read, there is something that can seem a bit ridiculous about experiencing somebody going through the motions of empathetic behavior, saying, that must really be hard, and you know that's on a script that they've gotten. Um, I also, you know, uh, I talk about uh, one of the medical experiences that I describe in the essay is I, I went through a heart surgery, and one of the cardiologists that I worked with during that surgery, oh, the one with whom I had like follow-up appointments after the surgery, and it was actually a failed surgery, so after the series of medications that I tried after that, she would do this thing that was so recognizable to me, um, where she would, you know, she would she would record after each of our sessions certain pieces of information about my life, and then I could hear her before she came into my room. I could hear her playing it. And then, ask, and then she would ask me follow-up questions based on that. So she would say, how is your PhD at Yale going, or something like that. And I knew that it was because she just listened and, and heard when she reported last time that I was getting a PhD at Yale. And I both kind of respected the idea behind it, but also could feel, the, feel a kind of hollowness in it. And so I think that's really where I started, was thinking it's sort of absurd to teach empathy in this way, or to teach a set of rote motions or rote responses. But as I kind of moved through the experience of being an SP, and in large part this did have to do with thinking about, as I was saying, how many variables are on the table for doctors in any given encounter, which you all know better than I do. But um, I started to really find a kind of value not in 
robotic displays of empathy, but in the idea of having a protocol or having a series of ways in which you are choosing to behave. And that might have to do with asking questions. It might have to do with um, having you know, certain, um, you know, sort of remembering to express concern even when you're preoccupied and thinking about something else. And I started to really feel like you know, so much of the time when we encounter other people in extremely <clears throat> difficult situations, simply relying on instincts isn't always, it's not always going to serve us well. Or it's not always going to deliver us to the way we can be most useful to other people. And so I really started to become committed to the idea of thinking about empathy in terms of choice and intentionality, not just thinking about well, the way empathy should work is that you see somebody in pain, you feel their pain as if it were your own, and you respond accordingly. But that actually empathy could look something more like you commit yourself to paying attention in certain ways, asking questions in certain ways, and kind of deciding to offer caring responses. Um, that, that that idea of making decisions and following through on them had, had really rubbed up against older ideas I had about what made behavior authentic or what made feeling authentic. Yeah. And I'm just going to read one more paragraph in the essay that kind of gets it at some of that, that evolution in, in my own thought. Empathy isn't just something that happens to us, a meteor shower of synapses firing across the brain. It's also a choice we make to pay attention to extend ourselves. It's made of exertion, that dowdier cousin of impulse. Sometimes we care for another because we know we should or because it's asked for, but this, this, this doesn't make our caring hollow. The act of choosing simply means we've committed ourselves to a set of behaviors greater than the sum of our individual inclinations. I will listen to his sadness, even when I'm deep in my own. To say, going through the motions, this isn't necessarily reduction so much as acknowledgement of the effort, the labor, the motions, the dance, of getting inside another person's state of heart or mind. This confession of effort chased against the notion that empathy should always arise unbidden, that genuine means the same thing as unwilled, that intentionality is the enemy of love. But I believe in intention and I believe in work. I believe in waking up in the middle of the night and packing our bags and leaving our worst selves for our better ones. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the really exciting and for me edifying things about this book coming out into the world is that I've gotten so much feedback from in the medical field and, and actually people in other fields as well. Um, and I, I want to read an excerpt from one of the reviews of this book. This review was published in the Los Angeles Review of Books, but it was written by a, a woman, who's, she's a writer, but she's also a doctor at Mass General, her name is Suzanne Coven, and she's, she's somebody that I've also done a few events with, and so I've gotten to hear quite a bit of her take, not just on you know, sort of literary construction of the book, but also about how these ideas of empathy and intentionality resonate with, with her experience of being a doctor. And in this review, she tells an anecdote about a, a kind of similar um, medical pedagogical enterprise that she was involved in. A few years ago, I volunteered to serve as faculty for an exercise called Giving Bad News. I wore headphones and sat on one side of a two-way mirror. On the other, a student acting as a doctor informed a patient that cancer had invaded her spine, that the back pain she'd chalked up to muscle strain or a touch of arthritis wasn't so innocuous, except that the patient wasn't really a patient. She was an SP, a retiree who'd been trained to play the part and, along with me, to provide feedback afterwards. Moreover, after watching a videotape of his or her performance, each student completed a self-evaluation form that included items such as builds the relationship, understands the patient's perspective, and provides closure. I was a little skeptical about giving bad news. I balked at the notion that empathy could be scripted, rehearsed, graded. But by the end of the afternoon, I'd been won over. 
The students who watched an instructional video before the role play were, in fact, more likely to ask the patient about her social supports and to offer pain meds, and less likely to interrupt her. Most impressive to me, though, I noticed that students who were, no doubt, empathetic people in real life didn't necessarily know how to act empathetically. One young man, who it seemed, when we chatted before the session, quite earnest and sweet, bungled his delivery of the bad news. So, doctor, what does this mean? implored the tearful woman playing the part of the patient. Uh, it means you have about six months to live, answered the student. Cut, I wanted to shout across the glass. But the woman allowed the scene to continue. Afterward, she gently told the student that his coldness had upset her. He apologized and seemed genuinely contrite. I believe that he would, in the future, be more careful. And I think part of why I like that story from Suzanne is that it gets at this idea that wanting empathy to be entirely intuitive, kind of that organically you would respond in the right way to pain, but when she talks about his student who clearly was, he was sweet and well-intentioned and had natural instincts towards empathy, that those natural instincts didn't always allow him to do the most productive thing inside the situation itself or to take care of, of his patient in the right way. Um, and so that idea of thinking about structuring responses a bit more um, really resonated with some of what I had been thinking about in my, in my own uh, excursions into the field. Um, and, and throughout, I've sort of been, you know, certainly I've, I've gotten all kinds of pushback. I mean, I, I never think of myself as offering, I'm not offering a, a program to anyone, but I do think that in talking about what did come to feel more valuable than I might have expected about uh, the kind of training that SP work offers and, and in the bigger picture, this idea that empathy can be taught maybe a bit more than I had thought. Um, I have, you know, I did a reading at Politics and Prose, and wonderful independent story in DC, and the first question was of, you know, I actually don't know what she did, but I, I think she was a doctor, and she was she was just extremely antagonistic towards the idea that um, that empathy could be approached in this way. Um, and so I think that there's certainly, I, I sort of felt that strain speaking back to at least the way I presented some of these ideas, but more than that, I've, I've heard from a lot of doctors who wish that there was more space in their field to talk about the emotional dynamics of what they do and the kind of emotional toll for everybody involved of, of what they do. And when I did, I did a reading in San Francisco and had coffee beforehand with a doctor who had recently graduated from Stanford Medical School. And you know, she was kind of, I had asked her about this idea that I, or this phrase that I've heard now a number of times of com com compassion fatigue, or the sense that part of that part of the, the rationale behind kind of titrating empathy or making empathy a bit more schematic is this idea that if you sort of allow yourself to feel fully and wholly towards every patient in pain, that, that you just run out, like it would deplete you so so quickly and so entirely. How could you sustain that over the course of a career or a lifetime? And you know, she said that actually what was more present for her was what felt fatiguing about trying to keep the emotional dimensions of her experience kind of under wraps. That she felt like there not being enough room for her to talk about the the emotional dynamics of what she did. That that was the thing that was a source of, of fatigue for her. So it was a kind of it wasn't compassion fatigue. It was the fatigue of trying to um, keep compassion quarantined or not being able to vocalize that compassion fully enough. Um, and uh, some of the other combinations, the conversations that have stuck out for me over the course of the past six months, um, I went to speak to a, a mental healthcare outpatient facility in, in Danbury, Connecticut, and you know, I, I did speak and I read a bit, but I really wanted it to be more of a conversation because I felt, you know, I, and I felt this in different ways in different contexts, like I get invited to speak to communities where I feel like empathy is being practiced and the dilemmas of empathy are being contended with in this extremely immediate, forceful, powerful way in a way that I, you know, I'm not providing 
mental health care to people who are kind of at the end of their rope and have been denied care everywhere else. Like, I don't have to, I don't wake up and do that every day. And so I felt like when I went to go speak to them, like, they had more to tell me about empathy than I had to tell them. Um, but one of the things that emerged from a few of those uh, healthcare providers was this idea, and this gets back to the possibilities of what can be kind of perilous or dangerous about empathy, was they were really stressing the importance of gaining and building trust inside of dynamics before trying to access a patient's pain or get them to speak about the pain. So that it wasn't, that the ideal scenario wasn't necessarily one in which you try to get the maximum empathy on the table as quickly as possible, but in which you actually, you know, built trust and established a kind of um, care and a dynamic and, and then inside of that safe space a certain kind of empathizing would be possible. But there was a real emphasis that I was feeling from some of them on uh, certain kinds of limits and boundaries and titration and that all of those were as important all of those were, it was important to think about those as kind of counterweights or counterbalances to this impulse towards connectivity or exposure. And, and I, um, you know, sort of beyond certain kinds of professional conversations that I've had, I've also just been very struck by the impulse that readers have had after reading my essays, some of which are quite, um, <coughs> confessional, they're quite memoristic, and people have an urge to share their stories in response. So I've, I've gotten, you know, both when I sign books, people say this in person, or I get letters or emails. Um, I've heard from people with uh, chronic, a woman with chronic headaches, a man struggling with the aftermath of being circumcised at the age of 18, I have a very long letter from him, a woman dealing with the death of her pet chicken, that was actually a blog post, but the, the book somehow helped her come to terms with that experience, and a high school senior trying to process her best friend's eating disorder, a homeless substitute teacher in Minneapolis, a neurologist trying to stay on the career track after multiple medical leaves of absence, and I just, I was flooded with stories, putting this book in the, in the world elicited it was a kind of confession that elicited so much confession in response. And that dynamic was interesting to me on a kind of meta level in terms of thinking about what, how empathy can work and how, what role reciprocity can play in, in certain experiences of empathy and, and how the, having exposed myself in certain ways made people feel more comfortable exposing themselves to me, which isn't necessarily, certainly not a prescription for a uh, doctor to expose their, you know, emotional lives on the table before their patients, but um, I do think it's, it can be a powerful, in certain contexts, I think that kind of reciprocity can be a very powerful dynamic, and um, my academic work, uh, my dissertation at Yale is all about addiction narratives, and the way that narrative and storytelling is a part of recovery, um, so how narratives work in a therapeutic context, but also how addiction narratives are turned into art, and looking at how the kinds of stories people tell about addiction, what they look like in the context of Alcoholics Anonymous or certain kinds of rehabilitation institutions, how are the shape and texture of those stories related to and different from the shape and texture of novels about addiction or memoirs about addiction, things that are stories that are told to be um, somehow beautiful or aesthetic, aesthetically accomplished. Um, but I think all of that, and this is certainly true in my work as a journalist as well, thinking about the tension between making experience present for another person through narrative, because in a way narrative is just like a delivery mechanism, right? It, it says, this, I am going to turn what it's like to be me into a kind of story, and that story is more comprehensible to another person. It's more transportable than like a bunch of random kind of data points of feeling or experience. But the flip side of that is that narrative also sort of turns things into smooth shapes and smooth arcs, and the smoothness of those narrative shapes can sometimes leave things out. Um, so that's like yet another way in which I think of empathy as kind of composed of tensions, like narrative facilitates empathy in all these important ways, but um, it can also deform experience for transport in a way that can occlude certain kinds of empathy as well. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is 
a bit more of how I have been asked or given the opportunity to think about some of the trouble with empathy. And this name might be familiar to a lot of people in this room, but somebody that I've had the chance to speak to a few times in the course of the past six months is a psychologist at Yale named Paul Bloom, and who, well, he's done a lot of work on child development, but he's currently working on a, a book about empathy. And he, the first piece of his that got, I think, a lot of kind of broader public attention was an article he published in The New Yorker called The Baby in the Well, The Case Against Empathy. And it, it's a kind of a, it's a purposefully provocative way in which he positions himself, because it's, it's true that he's not really against empathy. But his, his point in that piece, he has a couple of what I think are very useful points. And one has to do with the limitations of empathy as a guide to action on a kind of broader um, social level or the broader level of policy. And so he, he basically makes the point that certain kinds of suffering attach, to, attach themselves to our attention or attach themselves to narrative more easily. So um, the story of one individual going through something difficult, especially if that individual is somehow um, like, like you or identifiable in some way, that will gain more sympathy than uh, kinds of suffering that are more kind of ongoing. So he does, the baby in the well comes from the um, case of uh, Jessica McClure, who fell down a well in 1987 when she was 18 months old, and how this, her case elicited so much national attention and uh, monetary donations and sympathy and conversation in a way that, you know, clearly at that moment in time, many 18-month-year-old children all over the world were experiencing all kinds of hardship in a way that wasn't attracting conversation or attention at all. Um, and so he sort of wants to question the utility of following just instinctive emotional response in terms of um, what, what sorts of citizenship or participation will actually change the world in probably better ways. Um, I'm just going to read a short excerpt from that piece where he's talking about some of these kind of paradoxes inside of empathy and, and what, what good it does. Newtown, in the wake of the Sandy Hook massacre, was inundated with so much charity that it became a burden. More than 800 volunteers were recruited to deal with the gifts that were sent to the city, all of which kept arriving despite earnest pleas from Newtown officials that charity be directed elsewhere. A vast warehouse was crammed with plush toys the townspeople had no use for. Millions of dollars rolled into this relatively affluent community. We felt their pain. We wanted to help. Meanwhile, just to begin a very long list, Almost 20 million American children go to bed hungry each night, and the federal food stamp program is facing budget cuts of almost 20%. Many of the same kindly strangers who paid for baby Jessica's medical needs support cuts to state Medicaid programs, cuts that will affect millions. Such are the paradoxes of empathy. The power of this faculty has something to do with its ability to bring our moral concern into a laser pointer of focused attention. If a planet of billions is to survive, however, we'll need to take into consideration the welfare of people not yet harmed, and, even more, of people not yet born. They have no names, faces, or stories to grip our conscience or stir our fellow feeling. Their prospects call, rather, for deliberation and calculation. Our hearts will always go out to the baby in the well. It's a measure of our humanity. But empathy will have to yield to reason if humanity is to have a future. And part of why I think that some of Bloom's points or the ways in which he cautions over-reliance on empathy are, are, might be relevant in this context as well have to do with this issue of the vexed intersection between empathy and scale. So how does empathy allow us to care very broadly for our kind of larger human community? And I think it's also there's also an issue of scale that comes up in medicine where the issue is not just how is one doctor relating to one patient, but how is one doctor relating to 15 patients, or however many patients have to be seen over the course of a day? And on a kind of additional level of scale, like how is any given care provider going to kind of negotiate feeling for patients over the course of an entire career? And so it's this, you know, there's, there's something that is easier about empathy on a one-to-one -one interpersonal level than thinking about empathy across kind of um, broader horizons. And 
I'm going to read one more section from Bloom. Has also he recently published, and I think all this information is on the handout that uh, you guys have gotten as well. But um, in addition to his New Yorker piece, Bloom recently published uh, an article in the Boston Review just a couple of months ago that was the beginning of a forum. So Bloom published. Uh, an, an even deeper case against empathy in which he kind of broadens his critique. And they solicited responses from people across a variety of disciplines. So Peter Singer has a response, Sasha Baron Cohen has a response, um, they're philosophers and neuroscientists. And um, I respond as well because Bloom talks a bit about my book um, when he's making his case. And in there, he, he Bloom draws a distinction between um, empathy and compassion, and I think I would define those words slightly differently than he does, but his, his point is that you don't have to feel someone else's pain in order to care for them, and that actually it's easier to care for people if you don't let yourself entirely feel their pain, because he talks about the danger of empathetic distress, where essentially if you feel someone's pain too much, you render yourself less capable of, of caring for them. Um, and. That seemed to me to be um, a really important distinction to think about in this context as well, where he's talking about, um, and, and one that I certainly felt in, in my own experiences with medical care providers, where the thing I wanted most wasn't to have my emotional experience echoed by another human being, my doctor. The thing I wanted most was to be cared for in the way that they could do for me that I had no prayer or hope of doing for myself. Um, so I think I'm going to close off there and open it up for questions about any of these issues or dilemmas or tensions and I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Uh, we have a few minutes for your comments and questions. Um, again, since we have a nice mix of audience, uh, we're interested in comments from a variety of perspectives, so who'd like to start? <laughs> Let me bring you a mic. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ian Henry, and I work as an SP here at the hospital. And I'm interested in the, the way you express some ambivalence in the way you thought that we could or could not teach empathy not that we're teaching it, but allowing the facility for the student to, to do it. Because by the time they've taken the history of the present medical, present thing and the meds and allergies and all that stuff, they've hardly got any time to be empathetic, but they've got to have some expression of it. And they, if they're not naturally empathetic, then they have to practice it because it's going to be necessary in their, in their future. And it's like smiling. If you keep smiling, everyone thinks it's, you're happy. And if you keep being empathetic every time you see uh, an SP, then people are going to think that you are empathetic. So why are you ambivalent about it? Um, well, I think um, part of it, part of it is that I think I was more ambivalent about teaching empathy before I became involved in SP work. And I, so I definitely think that exposure to the dynamics of how empathy might be taught or might be usefully taught did show me that value in ways that I might not have seen going in. Um, I think that some of the ambivalence comes from the residual way in which I do, it's easy to feel a kind of hollowness in programmatic expressions of empathy. So even if in the abstract, intellectually, I can see that there's, you know, due to all those kinds of constraints that we were talking about, there is something that um, very necessary about having kind of checklist in mind or go-to motions in mind, but I still feel the, the discomfort or the sense of absence that can come sometimes as either an SP or a real person kind of feel like somebody's saying a thing that they think they're supposed to say. Even if in your mind you believe in people saying the things they're supposed to say, that can still play out on a kind of intuitive level. Hi, I'm Nil. I'm um, Eshin Stein. I teach at Sweeper. Um, but you got to this question um, that popped up in my head um, just kind of as you were getting to it, which is this um, 
the definition of compassion versus the definition of empathy. Um, and what you were saying about Bloom's work reminds me of the Martha Nussbaum essay, Compassion and Terror. And I just wasn't entirely clear what your idea of compassion versus empathy is, or just Bloom's idea of compassion and empathy. And I was just wondering if you could clarify that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Well, so I think Bloom senses that there's more distance and compassion than empathy, so that you're kind of feeling towards somebody rather than inhabiting their feelings, that you kind of feel a more general sense of care. Um, I think part of why I would come down in a different place than Bloom is I just don't. I don't see that those two things are separable, I guess, in the way that he does. Like, I don't know if you're not doing some work to kind of actually imagine yourself into what somebody else is feeling. It seems like the way you can feel towards them is extremely general. There's a kind of vagueness to it. So I guess that when I think about, I think I think about compassion and empathy as much closer than he does. Like, I don't, I don't know that I believe that you can draw those boundaries. And I think even if you are internally feeling your own emotional experience is more separate from another person's, that you still have to do some kind of imaginative work to, to think about what they're feeling in the first place. So that kind of that kind of entry has to happen. But I what I what I like about the distinction he draws is that is that I think it honors the gap in the way that I was talking about a bit earlier, in that I think he's he's pointing out that our goals shouldn't necessarily be to mirror somebody else's feelings. And that, to me, is, is I would frame it less as our goal shouldn't be to mirror somebody else's feelings, but more as we never can. But it's kind of important to recognize the, the persistence of that space between our experience and somebody else's. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that is exactly a clarification, but it, it, I think that, to me, there are kinds of distinctions that people draw that, just, they, that doesn't resonate with my lived experience of, of how feeling works. Hi, I'm Larry Merkel. I'm a psychiatrist and anthropologist. I'm a, there's an example where empathy and compassion are very different. That uh, you think about psychopaths, they are incredibly empathic. They have an amazing ability to get inside someone else's head and know exactly what they're feeling and what's going on with them. They have absolutely no compassion. Right, so there the distinction, the distinction is about a kind of intellectual ability to understand somebody else's experience versus caring about somebody else's welfare. But not just intellectual, they understand the emotions too. They, they can be very frightened by the feelings themselves, but, but there's no compassion. They use that then to manipulate somebody or to, to abuse children or whatever they want to have their needs met. So there's a distinction there. And, but in that sense, how you're using compassion, that phrase, like the compassion side of things would be caring for somebody else's well-being. Mm -hmm. Right. Just another comment along those lines, so Julie really kind of like, um, empathy um, can lead to connection with the other person, but it can also lead to suffering in yourself if you're the empathic physician who doesn't understand compassion uh, fully. And, one thing that I've come to understand is that empathy provides the energy uh, toward compassion. So it kind of helps me feel the suffering, feel whatever in myself or the other, but then it helps me move on uh, to a more compassionate state. And in compassion, some of the research in compassion using MRI shows that there's actually a place in the brain that lights up that, ha that includes the um, motivation to move, to act. So some people differentiate empathy and compassion as that urge to actually help. What can I do? And the doing may just be being present, or it may be loving, or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean getting up and running around. But um, that can be a distinction. I'm interested in how, and how, that's very useful to me, that, that compassion might include more of an impulse towards motion or action. How, and when you frame it as empathy as part of what offers you fuel or energy to feel compassion. How does that work? Can you say a few more words about how empathy fuels compassion in that way? Sorry, I'm I think just in general that if you're sitting with somebody and you don't feel very much toward them, you're not going to feel compassionate toward them either or be motivated to 
really go the extra distance to help or to show up or to care. But if you can feel their pain or your pain or, you know, get into their perspective, then that allows you to begin to, you know, become a human being basically and feel things, which then can uh, motivate you into uh, further steps toward really helping. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our hour. Not that the inquiry should end. So um, Leslie will be up uh, outside the upstairs.